Matthew, we're in a church. Wait, is it live right now? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, stand and worship the Lord. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Streams of abundance flow, and blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, and blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out. I'll to pray and when the darkness closes in Lord still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name blessed be your name sun shining down on me when the world's all as it should be and blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering with this pain in the offering blessed be your name dear saints I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord that beautiful name above every name and I want to begin our time together by reading from Psalm 33 it speaks to our own day and the present distress that we're under Psalm 33 and verse 10 the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing he makes the plans of the peoples of no effect the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. 
Friends, that's us. We are a holy nation. We are a new covenant priesthood. And we gather here Sunday mornings to do service to God, the God of gods, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the covenant-keeping God who gave his only begotten son as a new and better covenant. And we really want to honor him today sincerely from our hearts. I have beautiful things from the Bible to share with us. Let's commit our time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we approach you on your throne of grace. We thank you for the shed blood of Jesus and its mysterious cleansing power. We thank you for his broken body. We thank you that he bare our sins in his body on the tree. Thank you for the new and living way through the veil that is to say through his flesh. Thank you, God, for our bold access now into the presence of a holy God. We come into your presence today, Lord, to bless your name, to thank you, to praise you, the one who loved us first. You loved us from all eternity, O God, and today we say thank you and we say we love you back. Superintend this service today, O God. Bless your people who are listening. Be honored in what we're doing. In Jesus' name, we commit this time to you. Amen and amen. Praise our God. Friends, you may have a seat if you aren't sitting already. And um, just very quickly, just uh, a reminder that we're still under the present distress here in our land. We can only have 10 people in the church on a Sunday morning. That's me, worship team, my dear wife, and that's it. That's an, an associate pastor, Gilbert. Uh, we look forward to the day when we can fill these pews again. We ask God to make that happen sooner rather than later. But it, uh, for now, this is what we're doing, broadcasting over the Internet. I am in the building most days through the week. I invite the saints to come visit me. We've had a, quite a number of people come to the church uh, one at a time or two at a time to sit in the sanctuary, to pray, to visit with the pastor. Uh, I'd like to see more of that. That's wonderful. Um, I love this collection of believers that call New Life Sanctuary Church their home, and I, I wish you every blessing from God. Thank you, dear saints. Thank you to the saints that are here, uh, just a handful. Thank you to all the saints who are listening. I have just a, a couple of announcements. One is a praise item, and one is a prayer request, and, and we should pray together. The first praise item, though, is, uh, has to do with our brother Richie. Do you remember last week we prayed for Richie? And uh, I got a text from Katie this morning, said uh, Richie seems to be healed miraculously. That same day, we prayed for him, and uh, he is up to full health and strength. Are we shocked? <laughs> we serve a miracle-working God. No problem for God. Nothing's too hard for God. And that brings us to our second item here. We need to be in prayer for our dear brother, Rob. And I'm not going to share any details, but we're going to pray for Rob today as the Lord leads, as the Holy Spirit guides my heart, my tongue. Uh, we're going to pray together. So let's commit Rob to prayer, and then we're going to continue honoring the Lord with our songs, okay? Almighty God, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving for your goodness and your kindness. Lord, thank you for the freedom we still enjoy to come together, at least to broadcast a God-honoring service through the Internet so people can listen and join with us in the Spirit. We're grateful, Lord, that you answer prayer. You are a God who hears prayer, who sympathizes with our weakness. Thank you, Jesus. What a faithful and kind high priest you are. We love you, Lord. You're so kind, so good touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We thank you that you answered prayer and that Richie's doing much better. Thank you for that encouraging text I got from Katie. Please bless that couple in abundance. Encourage them, Lord. Show them beautiful things from your word that will encourage them, thrill their hearts. Help them to be productive, healthy, and strong. Good examples, good witnesses in the kingdom of God. Lord, it gives us faith to believe you'll answer our prayers regarding our dear brother Rob now. We lift up Rob to you today, Lord. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will restore health and strength and soundness. We pray, Lord, that uh, he will be encouraged, built up. Pray that you'll give him extra special revelation from the Bible. Open his eyes to behold wondrous things from your book. Thrill his heart. Lord, bless the family. Bless all those who are connected to Rob, that love him, are concerned about him. Give them peace, the peace that only Jesus can give. Fill their hearts today, Lord. 
We commit these great things to your care. Put faith in our hearts to believe that you will do wondrous things that we can hardly imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a great God we serve. Let's honor this God with our singing.
Dear Lord, thank you for this morning we have to, to worship you. Thank you for the blessings that you pour out for us every single day. And we pray that you're with our pastor this morning as he brings your word to us. And we pray that this morning is honoring to you above all else. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning once again, dear saints. Thank you for joining us today online, around your phones, around your computers. In the present distress, we have to be creative, correct? God-given creativity. Last week, when I was done preaching, my dear wife approached me and said, I didn't like that sermon. My reply to her, me neither. It's a hard thing, but I don't, I really don't put messages together based on how much I like them or how much I feel others will like them. I put sermons together based on how well I think they communicate truth from the Bible. And as a matter of fact, nine times out of ten, the truths that we are confronted with are very encouraging. But from time to time, we just need to hear what God wants to tell us, whether it makes us feel happy or not. And I'm trying to be a faithful pastor. And having, now having said that, I do think today is going to be much nicer than last week. So I hope that last week you weren't turned off. I hope that people are tuning in and listening because we do want to consider some very important things that actually speak to us and our new covenant priesthood. Very important. Now we're going to be in Second Chronicles 22, Old Testament. But of course the whole Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and what he was going to come to do. Second Chronicles 22, that's where we're going to be today. And just quickly as an aid to the memory, you remember last week we were thinking about King Jehu. King Jehu, king of Israel. Not a good person. He was sort of God's weapon to obliterate the wicked household of Ahab, but the man just went way too far, and he actually took out the king of Judah while he was at it. And he so weakened the kingdom of Israel that the pagans began to move westward and began to take Isra Israeli territory. And we said, there's a little message there, isn't there? Don't be dancing out there on the periphery of God's religious program. It's not safe for you at the best of times, but when the threat is coming, when the threat is there, approaching, you want to be where Jesus is, in the center of the center of the program. Jesus Christ, he is that one like the Son of Man walking in the midst of the lampstands. The lampstands, the churches, Revelation 1. That was a little message there. The first people to be taken out of the picture were those who were dancing out there on the periphery of God's religious program. That is my gentle, maybe powerful reminder that if you are a New Covenant priest, a believer in Jesus Christ in the present dispensation, you've got to be connected to the church. There's no such thing as it's just me and Jesus. No. Jesus came to purchase to himself a bride. It's the church in the present dispensation. We are the priesthood. We are the custodians of the life-saving gospel. We want, to be, we want to be connected to that, not just a bit, but as close as we can. Now, that's the challenge. that is a real challenge today when wicked governments are doing everything they can to, to break the church apart. But God is greater, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, Christ's masterpiece. That's important, okay? Now, even though today the message is going to be uplifting, I think it does start a little bit hard. Go look at 2 Chronicles 22.10. 2 Chronicles 22.10. Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. Her son was the king of Judah. He was taken out by Jehu, who just went too far. And this is shocking. Uh, her attitude here, her actions, are not what we expect from any normal mother. Oh, her son has just been murdered. What do you expect her to do? Maybe mourn? How about that? Maybe fast? Maybe pray? Maybe repent? Seek the face of God? No way. This tragedy here just revealed what was already in her heart. While her son was on the throne of Judah, she played the role as the king's mother, but deep down, she had a deep desire to take that power to herself. And this was her golden opportunity. It was a ripe fruit that fell into her hands. My son is gone. I will become the power center here. And you know, this reminds me of the kingdom age when Jesus Christ returns to reign and rule over a restored created order. The Bible talks about that blessed age, a thousand years with a perfect king reigning and ruling righteously over a perfect environment, a perfect government, perfect uh, princes, politicians, governors, rulers, all perfect. And guess what? You'll have generations being born in that perfect environment, men and women growing up who secretly in their heart of hearts hate Jesus, the wise king. They hate him. Most of them won't say anything, but secretly in their heart of hearts, they cannot wait for Satan to return. Satan, of course, incarcerated in the pit for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, he'll be released. And he will succeed fantastically in amassing an army whose number is like the sand of the sea. And they'll march against Jesus and his saints in Jerusalem. Can you believe that? You never would have wrote, you, if, you, if the Bible was a human book, you never would have put that in there. You would have said, Jesus returns, establishes his kingdom, and they all lived happily ever after. No, that's not how it goes. You know, it's just to show you, friends, that the human heart is uh, desperately wicked hopelessly, incurably wicked, sick. There's a sickness there. It's always been, it's always been about heart position. And there's really, a, a, there's only one cure. And it's, it's, it's God in Christ. He alone.
can reach down and make that kind of adjustment in your hearts and mind too. The kind of adjustments that need to be made to make us fit citizens in that new heavens and new earth that he's preparing. See? Nothing else will do. A perfect environment won't do it. You can't clean up a slum and think that things are going to go well. No. You just made the criminals more uh, comfortable. <laughs> Isn't that true? Gilbert, I mean, you, you minister right there. Murder, what is it? Murder Acre? What do they call it? Murder Acre in the north end of Winnipeg. People being shot and stabbed and killed and this and that and the other thing. And you don't just throw money at the problem. It's not going to solve anything. You don't just clean up the slum. It's not going to solve anything. Hearts need to change. And it's, it's quite amazing that a quick change in environment or status or your condition can reveal what's really, really there. And I've seen that recently, in North America especially, affluence or success or p harsh persecution can burn away the mask that people wear and reveal what's really in their hearts. Just like Athaliah, mother of the king. Her son's death revealed what was really, really there. There's a couple guys I used to love watching on YouTube. A couple goofy guys. So much fun to watch them. I think their affluence, their success has gone to their heads. The liberal agenda has reached them. They've publicly, openly, proudly have renounced Jesus. Are you shocked? We shouldn't be. A sudden change in status or environment can reveal what's already there. And that's what happened with Athaliah. Well, look at this now. It's going to get um, a little more uplifting. Look at verse 11. 22, 11. But Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. Verse 12, and he was hidden from them in the house of God six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Here and in 2 Kings chapter 11, it's the wife of the high priest who gets first mention, top billing, in this rescue operation. She's a courageous lady. She led the charge in a stunning display of courage. She hid baby Joash from wicked Athaliah. She, she gets top billing. I'm not sure how all this happened, but somehow she led the charge. You know, the Bible, it, the Bible is such an honest book. It tells us what really, really happened. And I get so sick and tired of people who hate God and hate the Bible. They want to say ridiculous things like, the Bible is misogynistic. It's a book that was written by people who are patriarchal in their thought, and they hated women, and this and that, and they want to subjugate women. She's the hero here. And the Bible's not ashamed to say it. If you have eyes to see, you'll see it. She's the hero. Six long years in hiding. Hiding where? In the dilapidated temple. The last place wicked Athaliah is going to look. The high priest and his faithful wife took that baby into the temple, nurtured that child for six years. That was risky, that was costly, and that was sustained. Six years, year after year, protecting the life of the future king. And I want us to see the motive here. Why did they do this? What was the point? Look at chapter 23, verse 1. In the seventh year, Jehoiada, that's the high priest, strengthened himself and made a covenant with the captains of hundreds. We have a military force now being amassed. Drop down verse 2, 23, 2. And they went throughout Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the chief fathers of Israel... And they came to Jerusalem. Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. And he said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has said of the sons of David. That's the motive. This man is mindful of the word of God. God made promises to King David. He said, David, you're a man after my own heart. This is 2 Samuel 7. David, you're always going to have a man on that throne, on that Judean throne. Your son is going to reign and rule on that throne. I make a promise to you. I make a covenant to you, says God to David, and I'm a covenant-keeping God. I don't lie to David. I don't lie to people. 
So Jehoiada and, and his faithful wife, they said, well, we better do something. God said, David's son is to reign and rule on that, on that Judean throne. So we better step it up and we better preserve little Joash so he can grow up and take his rightful place. And here, once again, friends, we are confronted with that very mysterious relationship between God's absolute sovereignty and human free will and responsibility. God said, it pleases me to have a son of David on that throne. And the high priest and his wife said, well, we better, we better do something so that this can happen. Now, have you gotten that? That's a tension there, isn't there? There won't be a, a Davidic king on that throne unless we step in and protect little Joash. But God promised there'd always be a, a son of David on that throne. And that's the tension between the two. We don't say, well, God's in charge. I don't have to do anything. No, we have real responsibilities. And sometimes it involves risk, and sometimes it involves sacrifice. Sometimes it involves really putting yourself out there, putting sometimes our lives are on the line. And I know where you are, Pastor Gilbert. Even this morning we had a little episode here at this church trying to help people. And the, the situation could become potentially volatile. But that's what it costs sometimes to be a faithful servant of Jesus. See? Now, uh, if I could just synopsize what happened here, because we want to get to um, things that really concern us here. What Jehoiada did, he brought his little military force into the temple. And you know what was in the temple? Weapons. Weapons that used to belong to King David himself. And so Jehoiada armed the soldiers with these ancient weapons, and he brought little Joash out into the public square with an armed military escort, and he publicly anointed Joash king of Judah, pleasing to God. There's that son of David. He's going to reign and rule, just like I promised the Lord could say. Well, Athaliah, that wicked queen mother, was so distressed, she hooted and hollered, and she really tried to uh, make a scene there, but it was to no avail. She was taken outside, and she was summarily executed for her crimes. And we want to say, praise the Lord. Justice at last. At last, we read about some justice. Now, in 23, verse 16, I want us to read a little stretch here, and this is really going to speak to us of our own place in the current uh, dispensation. But let's go to verse 16. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself, the people, and the king, that they should be the Lord's people. And all the people went to the temple of Baal and tore it down and broke in pieces its altars, its images, and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. Also Jehoiada appointed oversight of the house of the Lord to the hand of the priests, the Levites, whom David had assigned in the house of the Lord, to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and with singing, as it was established by David. And he set the gatekeepers at the gates of the house of the Lord, so that no one who was in any way unclean should enter. Then he took the captains of hundreds, the nobles, the governors of the people, and all the people of the land, and brought the king down from the house of the Lord, and they went through the upper gate to the king's house and set the king on the throne of the kingdom. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet, for they had slain Athaliah with the sword. It seems very positive. A little bit ghastly. We have a capital punishment taking place there. We have the violent destruction of false religion there in Judah. But we also have rejoicing. We're doing what's right. We're doing what God has commanded. There's a Davidic king sitting on that throne. We've protected his life, and we are reinst reinstating a proper, a proper religious system. It's very positive. It's, some, you know, it's very rare almost in the Bible to see people doing what's right. You know, it's a very accurate account of human history. But this is something that we can pause and reflect on and, and, um, and rejoice over. At long last, God's people are doing what's right. Now, but the thing I want to hammer on here, the thing I want us to focus on, really, it's what happened, the events, and their succession. The order. It's really, really important. This jumped out at me. 
under God. I believe God's showing me this, and I want to share it with you because I think it's very encouraging. But the very first thing that we read here in verse 16 was that a covenant was established there in Judah between who? Between the high priest, the king, God, and the people. Four participants in this covenant. The priest, the king, God, and the people. Now you think about the current dispensation. We are new covenant priests. Jesus Christ has come into the world and he has established a new and better covenant. According to the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is four out of those, or rather three out of those four participants in the covenant. Jesus Christ just is the high priest. He is the king. He is very God of very God, and he has established a covenant with us, his people, a much better covenant. Isn't that amazing? In fact, Isaiah 42 says something that I can hardly believe, but I have to believe it because it's in the Word of God. Isaiah 42 says that he was sent not only to establish a covenant with the people, he actually is the covenant with the people. He is the very Word of God. He is the covenant. I've said it before, Jesus Christ is not just God's messenger, he is the message. He's not just the way shower, he's the way. He's the truth, he's the life, the goal and the direction. He really is the very reason anything's ever come into being, he is the reason for everything that ever will. Of him are all things. All things are of him and through him and to him, Paul wants to say in his epistle to the Romans. The centrality, supremacy, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Him we preach, Paul says to the Colossians. Him we preach, warning every man. And that's what we want to do as faithful new covenant priests and ambassadors of the Most High God. Notice the second thing. After the covenant was established, next thing on the agenda, what are we going to do? We're going to destroy all competing phony faith systems, all competing religious, philosophical faith systems, every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, His person, plans, and purposes, they are to be brought down, destroyed, never to be resurrected again. They marched right into the temple of Baal and knocked the thing to the ground and killed the high priest. Now, in the current dispensation, we don't go do that. We don't take up arms and we don't start I'm not going to march into a mosque or something or a Buddhist temple and start getting violent. We're not going to do that. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, but they are what? Mighty for the bringing down or casting down of strongholds. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, we are to cast down every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. We're to do that through what? Through prayer through sound argumentation, reasoning with people. That's what we're supposed to do. And what are the enemies? Who are the enemies out there? False religion, number one on the, on the agenda. False religious systems. Mankind, of course, is incurably religious. We are built to worship. So what has Satan done? Satan has authored an entire plethora, a multiplicity of competing religious faith systems out there. And today you can choose the one you like, or if you don't like anyone that's out there, you can just start mixing and matching and create your own religious system. And there you can just start worshiping any way you like, any god you like. Just invent one if you want to. I mean, it's so artificial. It's so phony. It's so irrational. It's completely insane, but that's what people do. I was in the library one time. I think I mentioned this. I saw a book there. It was a how-to book for uh, teens who are struggling with same-sex attraction. And the book basically, of course, it's, it's a Canadian publication, so it says, well, you go for it. You be gay and be proud of it. And then there's a question-answer section in that book. And it says, what if the religious institution of which I am a part frowns on this lifestyle? Answer, you need to find a different religious institution. You need to find a church that's more inclusive. Not once in that book did it recommend its reader to go and do a little research to find out if it might just be the case. 
that God's prescriptions against that lifestyle just might be true. Truth is never considered. It's all about how you feel. So just create a religious philosophy you like. If it makes you feel good, then it's, then it's fine. Friends, that, that is not even rational. That, we don't operate like that in real life. You don't see a people walking down, you see a, you see a person walking down the street. You say, look out, there's a bus coming. He doesn't say to you, well, that doesn't make me feel very good. I think I choose not to believe that. You think the bus is just going to evaporate and vanish because he doesn't like that idea? It's going to squash him flatter than a pancake is what's going to happen. Our feelings on the subject have no bearing on what is true. Is it true? Is the Bible true? Of course it's true. How about scientific opinion? There's another thing that needs to be brought down to the ground. Of course, I'm talking about origin science. We have armies of so-called scientists in their lab coats and their clipboards telling us all about the beginning of the universe 15 billion years ago. Of course, they weren't there. They had no part in it. They didn't watch it happen, but they'll tell you all about it. A pagan nature myth called the evolution story, which comes into head-on collision with God's revealed word, a perfect word given by a perfect God who is the architect, the creator, the sustainer of the entire cosmos. He gave us his word. He tells you, I was there. I did it. I didn't use a big bang. I didn't use millions of years. I didn't use evolution. God comes right out and tells you how he did it. And we're supposed to believe the scientists whose opinions are always shifting, always vacillating, always subject to revision. I say we cast those things down to the ground through sound argumentation. How about popular opinion? There's another thing that needs to come down to the ground. Smash that into a thousand pieces. Popular opinion, dear friends, is very rarely correct. <laughs> Psalm 9411 says that God knows the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Popular opinion is very often wrong. We need to consult a holy God for truth. He's given us a Bible, and it's true. Always true, every time true, in no need of revision. Consult God's Word. Everybody and everything must come to the bar of Scripture to find out if our thoughts are true, if our actions are moral. And that's just how that is. And aren't you grateful to God for a Bible? Well, here's another thing that needs to come down, another high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Wait for this one. It's called personal desire, and that's a hard one. That now we're, you see, when I talk about false religion, we're like, amen, brother. Popular scientific opinion, amen, brother. Well, now we're talking about personal desire. And Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you take that cross, you carry it daily. You get crucified to self. You die to self. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, says Paul. And that's our cry too. Personal desire often comes into head-on collision with what God has clearly said in the Bible. And I say, and I've said this before too, when God tells me not to murder I say, no problem, Lord, I'll obey that command. Am I really obeying? I'm just sort of like agreeing with him. But when God says, I want you to do this, and I say, Lord, I don't want to do that. Now I've got my Calvary. Now I've got two wills colliding here, intersecting, and I need to get on that cross and die. That's not easy. But Jesus Christ the Lord is here to help us. He was a spirit-filled, spirit-led man, and he can show us how to do it. Correct? That's a high thing that needs to come down sooner rather than later. The last thing here, the last in this little series of things, was the reestablishment of proper religious order. God is not a God of chaos. He is not a God of confusion, but a God of order. Here, we saw that the priests were assigned duties to superintend the entire religious ritual program there associated with the temple in accordance with the Mosaic law. And the whole system, you'll notice, was protected. No unclean person could come in. All in accordance with the Mosaic law. Today, of course, we're under a different dispensation. There's a different religious program. Today, we're in the church age. 
but there are very remarkable and important parallels to what's going on here. God's religious system for the present dispensation, the church, needs also to be protected. That's why, you know, I'm not proud to say this. It doesn't bring me a whole lot of joy to say this, but I've thrown people out of here. I say, you're poison to this church, out, and don't come back. You think a pastor likes doing that? You think I like to see an empty chair in the, in the church? But that has happened from time to time. An unclean person coming in here meaning to do harm to the family of God, I'm going to throw you out. You, and all of us should get behind that. Uh, I mean, a, a person who is not a Christian is certainly welcome here. You're not a Christian? Come on in. Observe what we're doing. Hear the gospel and believe to the saving of your soul. You're welcome here. Of course you're welcome here. You come in here with nefarious purposes. You want to use people. You want to harm people. You want to disrupt what's going on here. You are not welcome. We're going to do like Jehoiada did. Out you go. It's important what we're doing here. We should have a keen interest in the religious system of this present dispensation. We ought to have a keen interest in what God is doing religiously, just like Jehoiada, just like the high priest, just like King Joash. We ought to have a keen interest in this. It can't be just me and Jesus. Well, I, get to watch, I can watch guys on the, radio, on the TV. I can watch preachers on YouTube. I can just listen to the radio programs. I understand in the present distress we have to do what we have to do. But when the doors are open and people are allowed to gather, we need to be gathering. We need to be connecting with each other. It's super important. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, the church is his building project. Is it important? Jesus said, I'm building this thing. It's important to Jesus. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5 says that Jesus Christ loved the church. He loved her. He gave himself for her. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, he purchased her at a very high price. Acts 20:28 20, says, God purchased the church with his own blood. Get, let that one sink in. Is the church important? You know how many people I talk to? Oh, I'm religious, but, uh, uh, but I don't believe in organized religion. Or how about this one? I'm spiritual, but I don't see a need to be connected to a church. You know, and then I have people say things like that who claim to be Christian. You need to open the Bible. You need to hear what Jesus Christ and his apostles had to say about the church. No spiritually healthy, mature Christian is indifferent to the church. Impossible. You can be a biblically shallow Christian and not care about the church. You can be a spiritually immature Christian and not care about the church, but you cannot be a well-informed, spiritually healthy, mature Christian and care nothing about the church. Impossible. Not when you read all that God has to say about the church, his religious program in the present dispensation. The church of Jesus Christ is not some kind of organization. We're not the Vatican. The church of Jesus Christ is a living organism. It is the body and bride of Christ. And living organisms are organized. That's true. The New Testament church has a structure. It has offices. It has beliefs. It has ordinances. It has practices all spelled out in fantastic detail in the New Testament. It's, it's not for us to invent the church. It's not for us to decide how this thing's going to look how it's going to function, what its offices are supposed to be. It's, God has not left that up to us. Not something this important. No way. So we say, Lord, help us. We, maybe we don't have everything quite right. Uh, help us. Correct our thinking. Forgive us if we've gotten things wrong. We're not claiming we, we know everything or that we're operating infallibly. No one's claiming that. But under God, we're trying to function as a New Testament church in the way that we see spelled out in the Bible because it's important. God's religious program in the present dispensation has got to be cherished, encouraged, nourished, supported, protected, especially now in the present distress. And friends, I just want to remind you 
of who you are in the church age. I talk to a lot of Christians who are very discouraged. From time to time, our past comes back to haunt us. Mine too. I'm not immune. From time to time, we don't feel like we amount to too much. But you know, your feelings are not ultimate, right? It's what God says. That is what is true. Every time, all the time. And I want to leave us this morning with a beautiful verse from 1 Peter chapter 2. And Peter's going to remind us of who and what you are in the household of faith. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 to begin with. But you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're a holy priesthood. And we gather here to do service, priestly service. That's what we're doing. Here in the church, in the present distress, people around their phones or computers or something. But we're gathered together in the Spirit. And we're going to offer up spiritual sacrifices, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, of a broken heart, the sacrifice of praise and of righteousness, the sacrifice of joy and singing. We're going to offer those sacrifices to God. As priests with sacrifices, we're going to operate like that. Oh, but Peter has more to say. Verse 9, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. You are a chosen generation, dear saints. You say, I don't feel very special. You, you should. God has chosen you. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood under King Jesus. You are his own special people. You like that word? You're his special people. In all the world, we are the custodians of Christ's life-saving gospel. No one else is doing it. It's up to us. Is that important? It's the difference between life and death. That's how important it is. It's the difference between pleasing our faithful and wise king, and high priest, and disobeying him and, and displeasing him. It's really important who and what we are and how we function. His blessed church is to be encouraged, protected, cherished, nurtured. That is our call under God, especially in the present distress. That's all I want to teach you. I'm going to close with a word of prayer, and then we'll honor our God with one more song. Almighty God, we praise and thank you, Lord, for your precious, infallible, inerrant book, the Bible. What a beautiful, powerful, mysterious, sacred library we have right at our fingertips. We can open up your Bible, and we can see God's heart on whatever matter it is we're considering. Lord, how great, how kind you are. Thank you, God. Out of the abundance of your grace, your wisdom, your love, your mercy, you have called us all to become a chosen generation, a royal and holy priesthood, your own special people. To the world, we don't amount to too much. To you, we are your special people. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us your kind words to encourage and thrill our hearts today. Renew our strength, renew our encouragement, renew our zeal for the Most High God, the King of Kings. We love you today, Lord. We thank you for this time we could be together. Thank you that we could gather in the Spirit with other saints, other faithful believers who are also being encouraged by your word together with us. We commit our very souls to you, Lord, for safekeeping for guidance and for encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God.
praise forever to the King of Kings. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, saints, let's end our morning in the book of Nahum in the first chapter in the seventh verse. It reads, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He knows our hearts. He knows the attitudes of our hearts. Father God, we thank you for loving us. Father God, to you be all the glory. Jesus, we ask right now in your precious name that you help us to walk the walk and to talk the talk, to stand firm, Father God, to stand up for what is right even when we stand alone. Father God, may we be focused on the cross. Father God, may we speak only things that you want us to speak, to share things you only want us to share, Father, and may you be glorified and honored and praised. So, Father God, as we leave here today, put opportunities in our path. Help us, Father God, to share the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and may we go without fear and trembling, Father. Father, to you we praise. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, saints, and have a great week.